It was a good life. I enjoyed it anyway. I never, ever, one morning, didn't want to come in. I loved it. Every day I've come here has been, been, been a good day. It, it, it has been a really great place to work. More than 70 years after he began working at Radway Green, Roy Dale is back. The surroundings and technology have changed, but the end product is very similar. In 1940, construction workers battled against one of the worst winters on record to get Ordnance Factory No. 13, Radway Green, ready to supply Britain's military forces already engaged in the biggest conflict in history. It was one of five new production plants, all desperately needed. They were built in a hurry, but the sites were carefully selected and designed to blend in with the surrounding towns and countryside. Recruiting locally was not a problem, but expertise in the production of munitions had to be found elsewhere. They would have brought a lot of the senior managers up from, um, from Woolwich uh, because they were experienced in running Royal Ordnance Factories. And so the, the, the factory would have started being, being run by sort of Londoners really. And my husband worked here as well, so yes, it was a family thing. And his dad came down from Woolwich Arsenal he was one of the um, bigwigs in the main offices when the factory opened. They brought him from Woolwich Arsenal here. Served by a specially built railway line, Radway Green was soon a workplace for 15,000 people, producing up to 15 million rounds per week. But when Roy arrived in 1941, it was as much a building site as a munitions factory. In those days, they just about got dumper trucks, I think, but a lot of the majority was horse and carts. Farmers had leased their horse and carts, you know, hauling stuff about. Very difficult conditions, um, a very hard winter, snow and ice, and, and, and very difficult digging conditions because the, the factory sort of lays on a, a bed of sand, really. It all happened that rapid that you don't realise it's happened. You know, the roads became roads, and then they started building the loading factory, of course. Roy's first stint at Radway Green was short-lived. He went off to help build the Mulberry Harbour, planned years in advance for a vital role in D-Day, and then spent four years in the Royal Navy. I came back to get married and settle down, actually. Good thing or not, I don't know. <laughs> Peace and a stockpile of unused ammunition meant the workforce was cut to 1,500. With its expertise in shaping metal, other work was taken on and Radway Green was soon making cookers and fridges. The factory stayed open as many of the other munitions factories closed. And when the Korean War started in 1950, production of .303 again began in earnest. Soon, four million rounds were coming out of the factory every week. It had its own brass foundry and rolling mill, producing brass and gilding metal strip for both small arms ammunition and medium caliber components. With the end of another major conflict, work again diversified. Radway Green developed a new process, explosive forming, which created a range of products, including industrial washing machine doors, stainless steel dental plates, and components for a new light gun. And in 1962, it started making coinage blanks in preparation for the switch to decimal coinage nine years later. By 1971, two billion had been made in Radway Green's D-Block. Staff were still transferring from London to Radway Green, but one move from Enfield was for very personal reasons. I started as a craft apprentice there, served a four-year craft apprenticeship, 
uh, and then went on to be a tool maker. I got caught in the housing boom of London and, um, and, and looked for somewhere else to, to move to, to where I could buy a house. Uh, and, and somebody had told me about Radway Green. For a period, they couldn't understand what I was saying and I couldn't understand what they were saying. When I started at Enfield, um, I was told that it was a very good apprenticeship uh, and, and, and somebody said to me, when you st if you get a job with the MOD as an apprentice, you've got a job for life. I, I never really thought in those days that I would have a job for life, but you know, it, it has turned out in that way. I've, wor I've worked for the company now for 47 years, so, so it has really, it's lasted me my whole lifetime. But others were warned their jobs would be short-lived. I can remember being in the, the apprentice trading shop and we had a little hatch for the stores and there was a little man, Horace, was in there. And he convinced me that I'd be lucky to see that year out as a 16-year-old. And th there's a phrase that used to go around, Radway's always closing. It's been closing since I've been coming here. Although there were fewer people than during the war years, Radway Green was like a small town. We got two bus, mini buses uh, that used to ferry people up to the top end train with two carriages that used to take them up to the top end after everybody come through the main gates where we were and we'd be checking passes. There were over three and a half thousand people here and uh, you couldn't get round the factory in one day and I had to go round the factory every day on health and safety rules um, and I just couldn't get round in one day so we had to do certain shops at certain days. There was a form for everything. If you wanted to use a telephone, you had to fill a form in. You had to ask to, get to use the toilet. Uh, and the, the two apprentice supervisors who, I think it was a bit, a bit of a, a bit like pantomime villains, re villains really. They knew how to keep you in check and, and they were you know, quite officious. But it was a bit tongue in cheek, but you weren't to know that until some considerable time. And I think it worked because it, it gave the discipline that I think uh, the, the MOD liked. It took quite a few years before you started to know people by first names. Most people then just see you coming and, oh, because you're in a police uniform, just keep out your way like, you know. In this typically English countryside is Redway Green, the Royal Ordnance Small Arms Ammunition Factory. Starting from the basic raw materials, a full range of small arms ammunition is made here and exported around the world. Between 1976 and 1979, major work was carried out to refurbish C Block. The result was an integrated manufacturing, loading and packing facility, the biggest and most modern in Europe. And on the 30th of March 1979, it was opened by the Duke of Edinburgh. In parallel to the improved buildings and modern machinery, new products were also being developed. Raden, 27mm Mauser ammunition for tornadoes, and in the 80s, 5.56mm ammunition for the SA-80 weapon system. In 1985, the ROFs were privatised, and in 1987 sold to British Aerospace, which later became BAE Systems. Privatisation brought about many changes. I think you were given more opportunity to develop, rather than, you know, like I say, being that, that's your grade, your role, and that's it. You know, if X needs to be done, it has to be that person that does it, not you. But the late 80s and 90s saw large reductions in numbers of people working at Radway Green and with the end of the Cold War and military cuts it was decided to close the brass foundry and rolling mill in D Block. Each continuous cast unit had two furnaces which fed it, mm -hmm. so that, was, that would be six. And then further down the foundry uh, there were individual billet furnaces. Uh, the most I can remember on billets I think it was four, but I could be wrong, it's, it's been a while. Yeah. So we, we could have had eight or nine furnaces going uh, per shift. Mm. 
I'd right. imagine this will be the foundation for the actual hot roll itself. Indeed, yeah. Cabin sitting over here. Yeah. Somewhere with um, Derek in there. Derek in the cabin. Yeah. Yeah. I can remember him now. Yeah. His smiling face. <laughs> But Radway Green survived, and in 2008, BAE Systems entered into the mass contract. The factory was about to undergo its second transformation. I think it's fabulous. I, myself and quite a few colleagues have seen this is like the second time around in terms of re-equipment uh, from the old wartime factory. Very labour intensive to more automated machinery, lots of conveyors. So we've seen that, and that was a, a step change then. Uh, and to see it again in, in one career, if you like, it, it's, it's great. There's pride in the investment and pride in the company's continuing commitment to helping develop new careers. I'm responsible for probably for about the past 60 apprentices that we've had on, on, that have come out of the time on the factory, whether in engineering or on the a skilled man. Uh, it's been a very interesting role, you know, it's been very enjoyable. Uh, especially to see them, a lot of those now have got jobs going forward. As more of the old Radway Green is replaced by the new, the man in charge of the site during its latest chapter predicts exciting times. I think what takes your breath away is, is, is walking into the, the new facility and just seeing how the quantity of what we do and the precision with which we make our products. The UK Ministry of Defence will always be our prime customer here at Radway Green. However, um, as the marketplace changes, we look more and more to export. We've been extremely successful in the export market already, and we look to build on that in the future. The people of all ages here at Radway Green are very proud of what they do and very, very good at what they do. Um, but what we're also really excited about is bringing through the new apprentices into the system, and, and in each year we bring a few apprentices into Radway Green, and training those guys up and making sure they, they understand they're part of the future for Radway Green. We've got a really exciting future here. It's absolutely fantastic today to see the, the situation. The people are good people and want to work hard for the place. Even now in the village, people will stop me and say, how are you, Sister Rolton? Which is quite, quite funny, really. 